Last week, we started this series called 23, simply walking through the 23rd Psalm, which is a poem, one of the most famous poems in all of history, uh, written by a king of all people, if you didn't know that. King David was his name. The second king of the nation of Israel wrote this psalm, a very devotional, very personal psalm, expressing this idea. David, earlier in his life, was a shepherd as a boy. He tended flocks of sheep, and he knew them inside and out. He knew how they worked, and he knew the relationship the sheep had to the shepherd. And so David writes this psalm with this understanding of seeing himself and seeing humans as sheep. And he knows two things about sheep we talked about last week. He knows that sheep are stubborn animals, that they don't want to be led, they don't want to be told what to do, but they're vulnerable. And so being led is essential for this animal. They have to be led or they're not going to survive very long. They're not going to make it. They're not going to thrive. And so he saw this relationship that he had with God. I am a sheep. I'm stubborn but vulnerable. And so I need a shepherd for my own good, for my own safety, for my own flourishing. I need a shepherd. And so he declares, we talked about last week, the first half of verse 1, that the Lord is my shepherd. And so today we're going to continue that verse 1 by looking at the second half of the statement. So today's idea is, since the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's the second half of verse number 1. And it comes from that. Let's just look at uh, verse 1 today. Psalm 23, verse 1. David writes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That, that phrase, I shall not want, is a bit outdated, we don't really talk like that anymore, and so I think most of us know the context of what that means, but someone who has no idea of what the Bible's talking about, or they don't read the Bible, or they're not a person of faith, or they're new to this whole faith thing, they might not, I shall not want what, right? And so a different way maybe to phrase that, the New Living Translation says it this way, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. Doesn't that sound nice? Wouldn't that be nice to say that? And I think we can, but I think for most of us, that doesn't seem to be our reality for whatever reason. We'll talk about maybe a few reasons why this morning. And it sounds like the perfect situation. Well, God's in control, and therefore, whew, I can relax. I, I, can, I can trust him. I can put my life in his hands and feel okay in that. I have all that I need. I lack nothing. But most of the time, we don't live in that reality. Sometimes, of our own choosing, even if it's unknowingly so. We don't live that way. So what I want to do today is talk about three, three different ways that we can choose to live our lives with this idea, I shall not want, or I have all that I need. And if it is your reality, praise God, let's, let's lean into that. Keep that up. Good job. Good work. You are the minority in that. You're not with the rest of us who are living life a totally different way. We're going to talk about three different ways we can live life in light of this idea that because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Three different ways to live life. The first way is simply this. Most of us live a life of comparing, a life of comparison. If we're honest, we spend so much of our lives sizing ourselves up to everybody else around us. We do. It's hard not to, especially in the digital age. Social media is everywhere. We look around. We don't have to look that far. You look at your neighbor, and you, they may not have the same life that you would want, but they have something, and they have a certain way that you're like, ooh, I wish I could do that or be that way or, or whatever that is. So you might say, man, I wish I could afford to live in that neighborhood. I wish I could afford to have that shiny new vehicle like, like this person has. I, I wish I could. We compare ourselves. We look at pictures on social media of our friends and neighbors and coworkers' vacations and think, oh, wouldn't that be great? Like, I wish I could have that kind of lifestyle. I wish I could live that way. We're wasting our lives by doing that. The comparison game is deadly, it's dangerous, and it doesn't serve a purpose. But yet we get sucked into that trap so easily. We can even look at, you know, our friends' kids who are so well-behaved all the time when they're, we're around them, and we think, why can't my kids do that? Why can't I be a good parent, right? I got a lot of parents who know exactly what I'm saying, probably every parent in the room. We compare ourselves. Here's the thing to consider, and I didn't plan on saying this. Switch the tables. Sometimes you're the parent that's being compared to, so it's okay. Every, well, no, Travis says no, but every once in a while, uh, every once in a while, your kid is the one where they're like, man, they're so well-behaved. Just every once in a while, that could happen to you. Maybe, possibly, one day it will. Who knows? Even at work, we do this. We look at, man, how did Jim get this promotion? 
He's the laziest bum in our office. I work twice as hard to make him look good, and he got the credit for it. Shereen knows what I'm saying. I got an amen from Shereen. So a lot of people are relating so far to this comparing life that we live. It sucks us all in. We, why, why did they get that and not me? We, we compare ourselves so much. Or we look at someone's talent or gift or ability, and we say, I, there's no way I could ever live up to that. There's no way I could ever be as gifted as that person. Like I'm trying to, I pick on my guitar and I practice and practice and I look, they're like Jimi Hendrix up there. What, I wish I could do that. Why can't I be as good as they are or as talented as they are or as smart as they are or as successful as they are? It's easy to get caught in this, it's trap, if you will, this comparison game, this way of living life. Even spiritually, if you're a person of faith, we can compare ourselves spiritually. Well, I'm a level six Christian. They're a level eight. How do I get there? Right? How many levels do I have to, how many stars do I have to get in this game to level up? I, what's the secret? You look, you know, someone, they, they lift their hands so gracefully in worship, and I can't even spell worship, you know? I, God answers their prayer all the time, and I feel like God's deaf when I talk to him. Is he ignoring me? Am I on hold? Is God just so sick of my complaining? He's like, oh my goodness, can you calm? Is that how God, it seems like that's all I get from God. It's a busy signal. Or static, and yet God answers prayer. Boom, God provides for them. Boom, what's wrong with me? We compare even spiritually. We live this life of comparing. And I'll be honest with you, pastors do the same thing, right? Ministry is a big comparison game, if we're honest, okay? You look at a, look at a different church across town, even a few miles away, and think, what, is go- what, are, what do they have that we don't have? Why are they seeing success that we're not seeing? What, what, why is this not working like it is for them? It's, it's a deadly game. Uh, it, it's just, I won't go into details, but it just is. It's awful. It's the, the dot worst dot, okay? It's awful. We do this in every area of our life. We're always looking at everything else, everyone else, And it's dangerous. Let me give you a couple of reasons why. And it's how you measure up in the comparison is which danger we face. First, think of if you you don't measure up or you find yourself on the short end of the stick, sometimes it takes away our motivation. We get discouraged. Maybe at work you keep seeing people get promoted, people getting raises, and you're just sitting and you're like, why am I working so hard? It's not paying off. I, don't, I, could, I'm, I could give 80% and I'd probably still be in the same boat. I'm going to try that. We lose motivation. We get discouraged. We, it doesn't matter. I'm not seeing the benefit of what's going on, so I'm, not just gonna, I'm just not going to try anymore. Or even with a skill or a craft, we're like, you know, I practice that guitar all the time, and I can't get any better. And, and, I, and I, you know, try to take vocal lessons, and I just don't have it. And I don't know what's going on, and I can't figure it out, and so I'm just going to quit. Yeah, I enjoy it, and maybe God wants to use me in that, but... I'm not seeing results as fast as I want to. I'm not, I'm not being used in that gift like I'd like to. And so what's, what's the point? I'm wasting my time. We can even spiritually stop pursuing our relationship with God because of this comparison game. We look at this person who seems so holy. Their life is all f- together. and They've got everything figured out. And God just blesses them and blesses them. And what's the point? I don't see that. Wor- it's not working for me, God. Where are you? And so we tend to sometimes back off instead of pressing in. We tend to, if we see, again, God as the shepherd, the Lord is our shepherd, we're like, I don't like where you're leading me. I can probably find a better way on my own. I could probably survive just at least this good, if not better, if I just take over the reins of my life, and then I would be a little bit better in that comparison game. It's dangerous. We can lose that motivation. Also, if we're on the short end of the comparison game, we can become very jealous very quickly. Because we begin to not just look at what they have, but we're like, I, I want that, and I wish they didn't have it, and I, I want that for me. It starts this downward spiral. We look at this relationship, well, they should be dating me because I'm better than that loser, right? Uh, or, I, again, I earned that promotion. They didn't earn it. I earned it. That should be mine, and I'm not happy for their success. I'm not happy for the blessing God's given to them because he's not blessing me, and so I'm not going to be happy for them. I'm not going to their, their housewarming party. No, no, I'm not going to. They're just going to rub it in my face. Look at this granite countertop, and look at these nice floors. I got, no, 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 it's just it's all a scheme to get me all worked up because I don't have it, and I'm not going to be happy for them. We play the, we play the game. We're going to live with those consequences. It's going to lead to a dark place that we don't intend to go, don't want to go, never maybe thought we would go, but we will eventually go there if we play this game long enough. 
But here's the reality of, the com- of a living a comparing life. And that is, we usually, if not always, compare others' highlight reels to our daily grind. Okay? Because you see the result that someone has of a certain thing and don't really know the backstory. Well, yeah, they've been at this company for 12 years. It took them a while to climb the ladder. It didn't just happen. Now, just because you got here two years ago, it doesn't, you don't know the last 10 years before that. It took them a while to get there. You don't know how long this person prayed for healing before God actually healed them. It didn't just happen overnight for them. It was a, there was a journey. There's a story there that we're not always aware of. We compare the end result to where we are currently, and that's not a fair comparison. Uh, an, an example of this with my kids is my kids watch YouTube. You heard of YouTube on the internets, on the interwebs, right? So they watch these families that, that vlog on YouTube. And they go on these crazy vacations, and they do all sorts of fun activities, and they just, and they condense it down to an awesome 14-minute video every day. And my kids look at them, and they're like, why can't we have that stuff, Dad? Why can't we live that kind of life? And I'm like, that's not reality, right? They do a lot of work to even produce the video. I mean, it takes hours and hours and hours of editing and all this stuff, and you don't see that. You see the finished product, You don't see on the business end the connection that this family has had over the years, the break that they got to become internet famous or to get 30 million followers on YouTube. They see the end result and not the work that led up to it. The the years that it took to get them where they wanted to go, that the family made a decision as a family. This is our family business, guys. Okay, we're not going to own a store. We're not going to farm. We're going to be YouTube stars. That's what we're going to choose to do with our lives. The family made a decision, all of them together, to do this. And our family's not going to make that decision. Kids, I'm sorry, we're just not, we're not YouTube stars, and so you just have to be your own YouTube star. And so my son wants me to plug his YouTube channel. I told him I wouldn't, but I kind of did. Uh, it's <laughs> he, he's been bug. I don't even know what it's called. I think, I think it's just his name, which is really dumb. It's not safe at all. What are we, what kind of parents are we? Uh, anyway, so don't play the comparison game. If you don't measure up, you're going to feel, you're not going to feel that. I shall not, well, you're going to say, oh, I want, I want, I want, I shall want, I shall want, okay? The other danger of comparison, though, is on the other end of that spectrum. If you find yourself on the top end of the comparison game, like, oh, you know what you're going to do? You're going to feel pretty prideful. Who has two thumbs and is awesome? This guy, right? Who's now a level nine Christian? Level up, me, you know, because I raised my hands high enough in worship last week, so I leveled up. We tend to do that. If we measure up really well, it all becomes about me. Remember, the first part of this verse is the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I shall not want. Not because Stephen's so great he made it happen. Not because Stephen worked so hard that he did it for himself. No, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I shall not want. When we compare well, we tend to forget the first part of that verse, and we turn this into me, and look what I've done, look what I've accomplished, look what I've made of myself, and it's it's easy to do that, because that's the American way. Self-promotion. That, that's what we're all about. It's about what I did, what I can do with my hard work and my two hands. And here, I'll say this, and I'll say it again later on. I'm not against hard work. It's great. I'm not against tr- I'm not against ambition. I'm not against things. I'm not against possessions. But if that's the end goal, that's a problem. If we if we compare ourselves because of these things that they have that we don't or this status that they have that we don't, that's not going to lead to a fulfilling life even if we get what we want. We'll never be satisfied. It's an endless rat race that we are tempted to live by comparing ourselves constantly with those around us. It doesn't lead to the statement, I shall not want. It leads to the opposite. The second way that we can live is similar, but it's really a branch off of the first one. That is, we can tend to live a life of complaining. We can live a life of complaining. We live in a time with the greatest standard of living we've ever known in our culture. But we often don't live like that. We live in a time of the greatest quality of life that we've ever seen in this culture. And yet we don't really spend enough time living that life. Because it's all about what I don't have. Or what hasn't happened yet. Or where I don't measure up. That we tend to live too much of our life looking toward the future instead of living in the present. And that never ends well. And it doesn't lead to that statement, I shall not want. It leads to, again, I I still want. 
That's not a good place to live. And we're tempted to chase after these things more, bigger, better, newer. And again, things are not bad. Possessions aren't evil. They're not wrong. But the thing can't be the end goal. Ambition's not bad, but just because I want to be this far on, on the, this rung of the ladder at my company, there's got to be a bigger goal than that. There's got to be something bigger at play than just I want this title or this income or this size house. There's got to be something more to that than just the stuff. An endless pursuit of more is not a good use of our life. Complaining about what we don't have is a waste of our life. And again, with complaining, there's, there's two things about that that show that we lack two things. When we live a life of complaining, we show that we lack two things. First is we really, if we're honest, we show a lack of trust in the shepherd. Because I can, if I work hard enough, I can get there. If I complain loud enough, it'll be given to me, right? If I talk to my boss long enough, he'll cave. If, I, you know, if, if my kids wear me down long enough, I'll finally give them what they want. That's how, we, that's how we live. That's what we tend to do is we complain and think it'll get us what we want. But it shows a lack of trust in the shepherd. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The second thing complaining does is it shows sometimes a lack of self-awareness. Let me give you an example. In Exodus 16, Israel has just, or the Hebrews have just escaped Egyptian bondage. They've been there for 400 years. Bondage, slavery, right? Owned by another people group. God frees them miraculously and he leads them through the desert to their new land. They are just getting started on their journey in Exodus 16 and they already start complaining. And here's what they say. This is, this, this is the most amazing thing. Here's what they complain about. They're like, man, I wish we were back in Egypt. At least the food was good. That's a lack of self-awareness. Do you not know where you just came from a month ago? You were being whipped to build pyramids for an evil empire. Are you kidding me? You want to go back to that because they had a good buffet? Right? And so what does God do? He provides magical food that falls from the sky every night. He says, okay, fine. If you want, I'll give you the best food. I'll give you food straight from heaven. Boom. You can get it. You'll have enough. You'll be taken care of. This doesn't happen. This is not normal. This is supernatural. God provides for them. And this is fine for all. This is cool. This is neat. And then guess what? I thought my kids were picky eaters, right? And so for the Israelites, magical food from heaven is not good enough for them anymore. And they complain about that. And they're, they're like, I'm just, I just can't believe that. And so it's, again, a lack of self-awareness. You'd, you'd rather be slaves because the food is good than be free and go to your own land pretty near in the future here because your taste buds are getting tired. I just don't get that. And we can be harsh uh, on the Israelites, but we do the same thing. Our complaining, especially in our culture, can show uh, a lack of awareness. Because if we're not careful, we'll complain, well, that thing's not new enough anymore. That house isn't big enough for all my stuff anymore. That car's not shiny anymore. I got it a year and a half ago. I got to trade that thing in. Meanwhile, three billion people in the world live on two dollars a day or less, right? Now again, things aren't bad. Possessions aren't bad. Wealth's not bad, okay? A big house is not bad, but if that's the end goal, that is bad, and we complain about we have all we have more than we need, right? Literally, we have we have more than we need, and most of the world can barely survive. Two dollars a day or less—that's what about half the world lives on. And yet we complain, you know, my 2015 is car is just not what it used to be, you know. Uh, and that's convicting for me, uh, and I think for uh, probably a lot of us in our culture, it's a it's a good shake maybe this morning. Be like, yeah, I'm I'm okay. I could do a little less complaining and a little more praising with what I've got. And so that's a better, that's a better way to live. And really, we're like the Israelites, too, in that it shows, like the first point, it shows a bit of a lack of trust in the shepherd when we complain. Because we, I prayed for God to provide, and he did, but it wasn't quite what I thought. My expectations weren't completely met. It didn't come in the way. I wanted the check in the mail, God, not a, sec, not a part-time job, right? You provided it, but not the way I thought, and I'm just kind of bummed out now. I don't really appreciate this opportunity like, like I probably should. We tend to do that. We, we spend our lives complaining, and it doesn't lead us anywhere. But here's a couple of scriptures to maybe help us to switch and see things uh, in a new way. Psalm 34, verses 9 and 10 says this, Fear the Lord, you his godly people, for those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. 
Okay, so again, it comes to the Lord is my shepherd. I trust in him, and he provides what I need. Most of the time, our complaints aren't really about needs. They're about wants that we think are needs, or wants that we say are needs, or wants that society tells us through marketing all the time, hundreds of times a day that you need this. This will make your life worth living. This will make your life better. You'll never be happier. And it's really not true. We're never happy when we live that way. If you follow the shepherd, you'll have all you need. Romans 8.32 says this. This is huge. Romans 8.32. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Through sending his son on a death march to take our place on the cross for our sin, God has shown us he will spare no expense to provide what we need. We don't have to worry. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in doubt. God has already shown us there's no price too big that I won't pay it to provide what you need. He gave up his own son to give us life with him. We're rebels against him. We're enemies of God, Romans says, but he sent his own son knowing that full well. They don't deserve this. They can't earn it, but I'm going to give it to them anyway. If God would go to that, that great of a length to save our soul, I think he can probably take care of our physical needs. I think he can probably take care of other things that are maybe a little less difficult to manage than that. And so we can trust him. We can trust our shepherd. The third way to live is, is the jackpot. It's the way to live. And that is to simply live a life of contentment. Live a life of contentment. Now, it's not always the most natural way in our culture to live. Because, again, the messaging that we see all the time is about you need this, got to have that, got to have two of those. Because you can buy one and get one half off, right? That's better than that. I don't need two garbage disposals, right, at QVC. I don't need that. I don't need 17 Christmas trees. Maybe you do need that many Christmas trees, but I don't. I don't. And so you can have 16. I'll just get the set, and we'll have enough for everybody in the church. There we go. But it's not natural to live this way, but it's the most beneficial. It's the most peaceful. It's the most joyful. It's the easiest way to live. It's the best way to live. So how do we do that? How do we live a life of contentment. A couple scriptures I want to work through just for a couple minutes today. Philippians 4 verses 10 and 11. Paul again here writing says this, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me. Again, he's writing to the, the church about um, finances, providing for him. He says, I know that you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't even have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Now, I don't want to disagree with Paul here because I would never do that, but I do want to add something to this. I want to bring it into this culture. He says he's learned contentment. I think in our culture we have to relearn contentment. I think we're born, I think we're naturally hardwired to be content. Babies don't need a ton for, uh, to be content, okay? Children don't need a ton to be content. We learn discontentment. We are retrained to then learn to what it really means to be content. Our culture uh, all around us tries to reprogram our brain. No, 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 you're not content because you don't have this yet. You're not content because you don't have that many zeros in, on your check yet. You're not content because you don't have this title or this thing yet. And so we have to actually relearn what it means to be content. And when we can do that, uh, it'll change everything. It really will. Let's look at one more scripture. We're going to take a couple minutes to work through this one. Philippians 4.19, very famous portion of scripture, but I want to break down a few key words in this to really come back full circle to Psalm 23, verse 1. Philippians 4.19, Paul writes again, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let's look at four words or phrases from this scripture just real quick. First one is God. He's the source. Okay? Too often... I try to be my own source, right? I try to, to work these extra hours to earn this thing that I don't need but I want because I think I need it. And so if I do it, then I can be the source. I feel like that if I can, if I can have what everyone else around me has or, or do what everyone else around me does, then I'll be happy, but that's me being the source. It's stuff, things being the source of happiness and joy and not the shepherd himself. And again, I believe in working hard and I believe in providing for your family and I believe it's okay to have fun and leisure and that's really where we're going to go next week. We're going to rest 
in green pastures and walk by still waters. That's important, so I believe in that. But I also know I have limits. And so I have to understand in my life, I'm not the source of really anything but trouble and misery. So I have to understand that my ability to earn a living and work for a living and earn an income is because God gave me that ability. He gave me the, the, whatever industry you work in, he gave you the strength to do what you do to earn a living. He gave you the intelligence to do what you do to earn a living. He gave you the interest in that field that pays you well and gives you a nice kind of life. So God is the source of that. Now, I, do I, the paycheck that has my name on it, right, but it, who's it from? It's not from your company. It's not from the government. It's, not, it's from God. The source is from God. God supplies our needs. And even when we feel like Stephen said this this morning, even we feel like we don't quite have enough, God's still the source, okay? The shepherd's still there. He's still leading us, even in, when we don't feel like we have quite enough. When it, the, again, the, the math doesn't add up. There's month at the end of the money, okay? Uh, we, God's still the shepherd. That doesn't change. He's still there, so we have to trust him in that. God is the source. It says here, God shall supply, Shall supply. It's a sure thing. It's a shoe in. It's a safe bet. God shall supply that. We talked about last week the endless supply that God has. He's not going to run out. He's not going to, oh, man, I didn't plan well for all these 7 billion people on the earth. <laughs> Whoops. No, he doesn't. God has an endless supply. And we've already shown today he spares no expense to take care of, the, of his creation. So we can trust him. He shall supply it. God will take care of you. Whatever you came in today, whatever need you had, whether it's emotional, physical, financial, it doesn't matter what kind of need it is, whatever need, whatever deficit you feel like you have in your life, God will, shall supply that need. Now, the next word is important. How much does God supply? Most? Majority? Some as he's able, and as he says, he supplies all. All of our needs. And I don't know how this is going to look for you every time in every situation. It's going to look different from time to time. You may have the same need 10 years apart, and God could meet it one way in year one and a different way 10 years later. He probably will. Sometimes we fall into the trap of seeing things, God do this the same way every time, and he's not necessarily going to do that. But he will provide all, all of our needs. As we follow the shepherd, we shall not want ever. He is sufficient. He is sufficient. And then he says he will supply all your need. Now, I'm not going to get into, again, not once. He's not going to give you the Lamborghini, although that's true, but I'm not going to focus on that. What I want to focus on is the idea that God's going to give you what you need when you need it. That's important. He's going to give you what you need. when. You, how many of you like practical gifts? Yeah. When I was a kid, I don't want socks, Mom. Are you kidding me? I don't want... I don't want a new sweatshirt for Christmas. No, I want a video game. Uh, but the older I get, the more I love practical gifts. You mean you're going to spend your money on my socks? Yes. I wear them. I need them. I love them. So, yes, I will let you buy them for me for Christmas. Yeah. So uh, the older I get, the more I find I like practical gifts. God is a practical gift giver. He will give you what you need when you need it. And so we talk about need and contentment and all these things, and a lot of times we do think about financial things. This is more than that. He says he'll supply all your needs, all of your need, right? So if, it, if there is a financial need, you can trust God will provide for you. But if there's an emotional need, you can trust that God's going to provide that for you as well. If you need strength for a really tough time in your life, you can go to the shepherd. He'll supply that need as well, all of it that you need to get through whatever you're facing, a relational need. God can give you wisdom on what to do or say to try to reconnect with someone that you've lost touch with. He can work on your heart and your emotions to maybe get over an offense that you should have got over years ago to mend that relationship. God can give you whatever you need for whatever you need it for. Let me give you an example in Scripture. So in John 2, Jesus does his first ever public miracle. He's at a wedding, they're at the reception, and they've run out of wine at the party. Now you would think that's not a need, Culturally, this is a huge no-no. For this family to not have prepared enough for enough guests is going to make them look really bad. They're going to have sort of this mark against them, this reputation against them that they, you know, they didn't have enough, they didn't plan well, and it's just going to make them look bad. And so Jesus is there, and after a, con a certain con amount of conversation goes on, they fill up these huge things with water, and then Jesus says, take a little bit and give it to the master of ceremonies and, and let him drink it. And it's water. But then when he drinks it, what, what does he say? 
He says, you saved the best wine for last. Normally, that's at the beginning of the party, and then after no one really is aware or cares how it tastes, then we get the cheap stuff out, okay? But he says, You've, how, how did you do this? Jesus performed a miracle of turning water into wine. He met a need that was there, okay? And so what does it say in John 2, 11? After the disciples see this, here's what it says. It says, the miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, they've already followed him for some time. They've already been around him. They've already heard his teaching, probably. They've already got to know him and had started a relationship. But this was when they first believed. Why? Because he provided the need. Now, here's the the important thing to get about this, that providing the need. Jesus could have just as easily turned water into glue, right? So if he's at an elementary school on the first day of school and the kids didn't bring their school supplies, he could turn a thing of water into glue if that's what the teacher needed. But he's not at a first grade class, right? He is at a wedding where they've run out of wine, so he turned water into wine. He met the need. So the key here is that God will provide what you need when you need it, exactly what you need. He's going to come right on time. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's not limited in any way, and so he will take care of you. You can trust God in that. One more scripture as we kind of wrap it up today. And this is, the, this is kind of bringing it all together. This is the key to contentment. This is the payoff to living a life of contentment. Paul writes this to Timothy. Godliness with contentment is great gain. This is really another way to phrase Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Let me ask you, what can you gain by living a life of contentment? What can you gain by living a life of contentment? Maybe a loving marriage. But you're not working 90 hours a week, so you see each other, right? Maybe a peaceful home because your kids don't resent you because they're fifth or sixth on your list. Well, you know, mommy and daddy work this much, and they have these hobbies, and they do all these things. They're never around, and so I, I know that I'm not that important. Even though we say that they are and we, fe- and we act like we do, kids are pretty smart, and they can tell by our actions and our absence And so maybe you'll gain that to live a life of contentment. Maybe you'll gain self-respect because maybe you've sold out to your business to earn this promotion and this promotion and this promotion and this raise. And you're like, if I could just be okay with a little bit less, if I could learn this art of contentment, I could, I could don't have to sell out anymore. I don't have to tote the company line anymore. I can kind of be my own person now. Maybe we can gain that. Maybe we can gain true fulfillment because we've reprioritized what's really important what's really key, what really matters, we can gain some true fulfillment. And let's look at the opposite, though. What what can you, what do you have to lose to live a life of contentment? And you might say nothing, but you can lose quite a bit. What can you lose? You can lose stress and the chest pains that come along with that, right? When I can learn to live with less and live on less and do more with less, and, and again, it's not all about stuff, but it's even about how we manage our time. And how we manage our emotions. If we're running on empty emotionally, we're no good to anybody. And so we have to sort of set those limits sometimes and learn, okay, I've got to learn how to navigate my emotions better. To be content with this maybe is not going to get done. Or this person, I can't make them happy all the time. Okay, So I have to learn in every area of life to be content. Maybe you can uh, lose some stress. Maybe you can lose some hours at work. God wants to give you more free time. Okay, He wants to lead you by still waters and in green pastures. And so we have to slow down. But to do that, we have to learn to be content so we can slow down. And we'll get into that again next week. What can you lose by living a life of contentment? Maybe credit card payment. Wouldn't that be nice? So again, God's not all in your money. He wants you to have more of it by learning how to be content. Godliness with contentment is great. Gain. Gain. The bottom line is affected if we can learn to be content at times. We can lose clutter. More space to enjoy life in this huge house or small house or whatever you live in. I can have more space because I don't need this stuff to be fulfilled. I don't need that. Learn to be content. You can lose jealousy. You can really be happy for your neighbor when they, you know, get this new job. You can be happy for your coworker when they get the promotion. You can be happy for this person when their need is met by God and you're still sitting waiting. You can truly be happy for them and find joy as we are content. And again, let me say this as we close. Things are not bad. Possessions are not bad. Um, Ambition is not bad. But let me just share this quote as we close. Robert J. Morgan, who's a pastor and author, he says this. He says, I can be driven in terms of goals, but content in terms of outcomes. 
It's really important we understand that. I can be driven in terms of goals, but I can be content in terms of outcomes. So just because I'm working hard and don't get the raise doesn't mean I have to give up. Just because I'm praying for this need to be met and I don't see it being met in the way that I would like doesn't mean I have to stop believing for God to meet my needs or deny the fact that he's already met it in his way in his time, even though it wasn't in my way or in my time. I can be ambitious. I can have goals. But again, I have to be realistic in the outcome and what God wants to do in his sovereignty in my life. So the question today as we close is what kind of life will you choose to live? Will you live a life of comparing and follow what others have? Never be satisfied? We can live a life of complaining and chase after all the stuff that you don't have instead of living in the present with what you do have? Or will you live a life of contentment in every area of your life, following the shepherd, trusting the shepherd in every area of your life? With your life today, will you choose to say that because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want?